you again, everyone, for joining us. My name is Kristen Connors, and I'm the Fellowship Scholarships and Professional Development Coordinator in Graduate Division. I'll be assisting with today's session. In this workshop, you will learn about and be able to explore real time the various resources available through our UH Manoa Library. I would now like to turn things over to our presenter from the UH Library, Brian Richardson. Brian? All right, thanks, Kristen. So I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully you should you should be able to, to see uh, to see this is the, the front page of the um, Hamilton Library website. Um, so welcome to the library. Uh, it's been a weird year uh, and we'll see how this semester goes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how things have changed uh, and how how we're hoping this semester is going to go. Um, but who knows how it's actually going to go. So we'll, we'll see how that is. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll speculate a little bit about that. Uh, as I say, this is the main library website. If you're going to bookmark anything about the library, I would bookmark this because it's really the portal to all of the stuff that we make available to you, at least most of the stuff we make available to you. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that we make available is, you know, are things that we pay for. Uh, you know, we, we pay millions of dollars to access online academic journals and books and so on and so forth. And when I say we pay, I really mean you pay, right? I mean, it's all, or a lot of it is based on tuition dollars and things like that. So, um, so take advantage of it. And a lot of the stuff that you'll find through the library is either really hard or just impossible to find, at least for free, in the outside world. Uh, and so, yeah, one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, there's a difference between something like Google which is you know great for certain things, and then also the the public library. And here I have their um, their page open here just to remind you or just to to encourage you to don't forget about the public library because Hamilton Library is a is a specific kind of library that's really geared towards academic research. Right, we are an R one university. Um, we have you know three million or so physical items. We have access to hundreds of millions of um, electronic uh, resources that are really connected to uh, empowering scholarly communication right i mean this is not the place to go if you want you know if you want to take out um, a harry potter book though we do have harry potter books but we don't have a lot of that kind of stuff what we have are academic books we have academic journals and resources that really support the education and the research at the library okay at, at, at the university of, of hawaii uh, the public library is a different type of library, right? It, it really has a much broader popular appeal, a lot more you know, kids books, a lot more like travel books, um, things on how to fix cars. They have a lot of, of videos, um, you know, much more popular ones. They also have Overdrive, which is a way of getting eBooks. We actually might, we might get Overdrive at some point for some audiobooks that we want, but, but basically they're, they're much more popular, much more, yeah, sort of how to's and relaxing and things like that. And that's not us, right? I mean, you know, we again, we have some of that kind of stuff, but Hamilton Library is really, it's a scholarly academic library. And so a lot of the resources that we make available are tied to that. Um, so with that in mind, let me just quickly give you an overview of the, the website of the main page. And then I'm going to show you how to search for things through some of our main resources. First off, though, I want to point out this green area here, which is the update on what's happening with COVID um, up until nine days from now, I guess. So, you know, the, the first day of class, the plan currently is to have the library open, right, which means that the stacks are going to be open so you can go get books yourself. The different specialized uh, collections will be open. You might have to make appointments for some of them, like the archives and maybe Hawaiians, uh, Hawaiian and uh, Pacific uh, collections and so on, but it, but essentially the um, yeah, the library itself will be open, which is different from what it is right now, and different from what it has been in the last year or year and a half. Uh, and the reason is is because of COVID, and so you haven't been able to go to the stacks to pick out your books, and that's been good and bad because one thing that we've had, and in case you're familiar with it, I want to point out that it's going away, is that we've had the ability to access copyrighted material through Hathi Trust if we own a copy. And so the idea was that if we had a copy in our stacks that you couldn't get to, you could access a digital copy from Hathi Trust, which I'll mention uh, in a bit as well. But that's it's a great large digitized book collection. And they have a lot of copyright stuff, a lot of out of copyright stuff. But, but up until you know 
the 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 23rd you can act you could access the the copyrighted material from uh from hockey trust but that's going away so i'm not going to talk about that um just recognize that it's going away unless of course everything shuts down again and then who knows so um this presentation is kind of going to be assuming that we are um we are opening you know for business so here's here's hoping um, okay, so here's the main um, here's the main website. Uh, just a few things here across the top. There are you know something like 27 or 30 librarians in in Hamilton at Hamilton Library who do public service, which means that they're you know, they're public facing. They they handle different collections and so on. Uh, so I'm for instance I'm the the College of Education liaison uh, librarian. So. Anyone, anyone at the College of Education would typically contact me first. Um, not necessarily though, uh, but there are other ones. Right? And, and so we have, for instance, there are three librarians in the Hawaiian collection, and there are two librarians in the Pacific collection, which means basically South Pacific, Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia. And, um, you know, and we have a maps librarian. There's a government documents librarian. There are four, I think, Asia librarians, a business librarian, and on and on and on, right? And so, one thing I would encourage you to do is to figure out who your librarian is, because they're the ones who are going to know a lot more about the specialized um, resources that are available to you. Uh, and I don't. Uh, I mean, I might, but you never know. They're, they're, they're a lot better, though. All right. And one thing where you can get that is if you go to the help menu up here, um, and I see that um, the link has actually been put in the chat as well. But if you look under here, there are the subject librarians. And if you click on that, you'll see a list of all the subjects and then who's doing what, right? So if you're doing anthropology, then David Breyer is the librarian. If you're doing art, then Sarah's the, the librarian and so on and so forth. And I would, I would get to know your librarian. I mean, this is one of the things, especially in the move from undergraduate to graduate, is that your information needs become a lot more specific and a lot more advanced. And I think the librarian becomes a lot more helpful in terms of just you know, clarifying where you can find decent material. Uh, decent meaning scholarly, I guess. Decent's a bit, bit of a vague term. Um, so that's one of the, the features along here. Um, in terms of services, one of the things that we're hopefully adding in a, in a couple of weeks, if we can get it um, finalized, is we're, we're adding a, uh, a loanable technology collection. And I think the link will be down here. And that's basically things like cables and chargers, but also cameras and tripods and various other equipment and so on. So you know, be on the lookout for that. Uh, again, we're in the sort of final stages of, of finishing that. Um, under research, there are various things we can talk about here. Uh, scholarly communication, one thing that we have is a, is a feature called Scholar Space, which is, it's, it's a collection essentially of the, the items that have been produced at the University of Hawaii, so by scholars at UH. And so it's a way of, of storing material here to make it available to, to our local community. Uh, we talked about help hear a little bit of already um the about you get uh, staff directory and so on i'm not going to go into a lot of details with these things but it just gives you a sense of what you can find where and so on the one that i want to point out more importantly is the you know, ill which stands for interlibrary loan again with the move from under undergraduate to graduate interlibrary loan becomes a lot more important then the idea here is that as i said we have something like uh you know something like three million four million items in the library uh, and we have access to, I'm guessing, hundreds of millions of, of e-resources e e of one kind or another, but we don't have everything. And so there is going to be a time, especially now with the kind of research you're going to be doing, where you'll find a reference to an article or a book or something, and we won't have it. Right? And so uh, the Interlibrary Loan Office is there to get that stuff for you. And so what you do is you would click on it, you'd log in. And then you'd put in as much information as you can in terms of the author, the title, the place of publication and all that. And then they'll try and get it for you. And they're amazing. I mean, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, and there are some things you're not gonna be able to get. Like if you, I know, you wanted the original journals of Benjamin Franklin, we're not gonna be able to get that for you, right? But if you wanted, you know, you know I don't know, if there was a, a photographic reprint of it from the 1960s, we could probably get that, right? So generally they're, they're quite successful. It's free, which is important. Uh, and you can do it as often as you want to, to support your, your research. And so take advantage of it. 
uh, yeah, and I'll I'll come back to this as well. I'll show you the form once we do uh, a one search uh, search. Okay, so um, but yeah, that's what ILL stands for, interlibrary loan. It's not a good term anymore. It's kind of outdated because you know back in the old days, like let's say the 1980s, um, it typically a, it was a loaning kind of relationship, right? Because you needed a book, you went out, you got you know we we got the book for you, we lent it to you, you gave it back to us, and we, we returned the book. Almost always now. It's digital. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a loaning thing. What will happen is you'll get, you know, you'll, you'll get a PDF of the article or of the of a chapter of a book. Typically, if you want a whole book, yes, then we have to do the loaning thing. But yeah, you know, I think probably ninety eight or ninety nine percent of what ILL does is really just send you a PDF of what you want. And so yeah, it's not really a loaning. It's a, sort of a document distribution system. But anyway, that's that's a digression. All right. This white area here is OneSearch. That's our big general finding aid. It allow it connects to the um, it, it connects to the physical books in the library, uh, as well as a, a variety of different databases. Not all of the databases, though. And so, uh, but you'll typically, and I'll show you how to go through this. This will be a good first search. It's really not a one search because it's not like that's the only search you should be doing, but it's a good general search. Okay. Um, Beyond that, we have the databases link here. And that gives you a, a list of all of the specialized databases that we have. There's over 500, I think, 400 and something. Um, there's different numbers here. And I'm, I, one day I'm gonna ask them why there's 555 and then 460. But you'll see here how some of these are very specialized. So for instance, we have the American Bibliography of Slavic East European and Euro-Asian Studies, which if you're doing Slavic studies, it's a fairly important uh, resource to look at. If you're not, it's not that important. And you'll find that a lot of these specialized databases are going to be very topic specific or discipline specific. And that's what you're going to want to get used to, right? And so if you're in anthropology, knowing the abstracts in anthropology is probably a good idea. If you're in education, knowing ERIC, which is a, a huge education database, is important. If you're not in those fields, probably not so much. But typically, again, you'll use OneSearch and then you'll use the specialized databases. That's kind of the, the, the general pattern. We'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, journals is kind of a neat uh, thing in a way. I, I say neat the way that librarians would. Um, in a way that what it, this allows you to do is find not a journal article, but a journal, right? So if I go like Journal of Educational Administration and Policy Studies, for instance, right? What it gives me is the journal. And if I click on available online, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but if I click on the um, access point, it then gives me access to the journal as such. And why this is important for you at this at this level, at the graduate level is, you know, depending on your on your topic, or depending on your field, you're going to basically start focusing on fewer and fewer journals that are publishing articles that are relevant to what you're doing, right. So if I'm doing educational administration, this is a journal that I'm probably going to want to be familiar with regardless of what the topics are. And that's a thing. I mean, it's one of the limitations of doing a search in Google or doing a search in OneSearch is you need to come up with the keywords, which means you need to know what you're looking for. That's not the case here, right? Because what I get is if I click on like uh, 2021 is I get a list of everything that this particular journal has published. And so I can keep up on the literature and I don't have to guess at the keywords and so on. I can just see what's been published in the last year or the last five years and get a much richer sense of the literature. And so that's one of the, the things to, to keep in mind. Um, I won't go into that anymore. That's but just realize that that's what that's looking for, right? It, or looking through is it's looking at the journal itself, not, not the articles. Uh, study spaces we might have available. This depends on COVID. We probably also will have graduate study carols that you can uh, you can take out or whatever reserve for the semester. There's a form for that, and I can I can send you that later if, if you want to. Uh, there are limited numbers, and it depends on COVID and all that. But basically, it gives you a place if you don't have an office uh, at your um, with your department, it, 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 you might be able to get access to a, to a, a graduate carol. Um, research guides. I'll quickly do this as well. Um, these are organized by subject. And these are created by the librarians at UH. And so here's another place where, like, if you're doing agriculture, click on there and you get uh, 
you get resources created by, in this case, Patricia Brandes is the librarian for, um, for agriculture and for CTAR in general. Uh, and so you get specific resources connected to what we're doing in Hawaii. So it's not just a generic, here's stuff on horticulture, it's here's, here's what you can access in Hawaii that's relevant to Hawaii about horticulture. So it becomes, it, if they're, if they're, uh, if they're well done, uh, they become very useful resources. I actually need to update the education ones. So don't look at the education ones at this point, but just realize that they exist and they should exist for pretty much every, uh, every topic that we, that we handle at the university. Uh, teaching resources. This is probably not that relevant for you unless you're a TA, uh, but we have some things like how to, uh, how to request library instruction, how to, uh, how to request streaming videos and things like that. So keep that in mind because if you're in a situation where you are teaching, yeah, and this is a new, a new uh, fairly new page and so we're adding to it now, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's a way of getting some, how to connect the library to resources for your, for your classes. The learning skills is another one actually, I, we're updating it right now, um, but it's uh, these are some of the basic learning and research skills connected to library. Uh, so one is an overview of the Hamilton homepage, which is kind of what I'm doing now. How to use your uh, my account to renew books and so on. There's some OneSearch, um, a general overview, and then also some more specific ones on how to find eBooks and things like that. Um, then I want to scroll to the bottom here. This is a um, working with material. We we've created a website that has a lot of very short uh, videos on how to do different aspects of Zotero, which is a bibliographic management program. There is a presentation coming up uh, in a couple of days on Zotero through uh, grad division as well. Um, and the idea here is that I would really encourage you, if you haven't already, to learn a bibliographic management program. Um, and what that means is that it, you know, it's a program that helps you manage your bibliography, but not just manage the bibliography part. It's also about managing you know, your notes and uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, like a library program that helps you handle, handle your articles, your books and so on, which you know, if you're in English 100, you've got five references, not a big deal, right? You can just do that all manually if you want to. But if you're doing you know, graduate level work where you've got uh, you know, you've got 50 or 60 or 100 references, and you're going to use those for, for years to come, then keeping track of them is a lot more effective. So Zotero is one of the three main bibliographic management programs. Uh, EndNote is another, and then Mendeley. Zotero is free, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, why we teach it. Uh, it's also probably more generically accessible. Uh, Mendeley tends to be more science-based. <clears throat> and EndNote, if you want the full EndNote, you have to pay for it. So um, but there are some EndNote workshops coming up, um, one in September, and then there's another one in October some, sometime. There's an events um, page that um, you can find these things on. But those are, those are the videos, right? And so that's where the learning skills um, videos are, are located. All right, let me stop for a second here and see if there are any questions or if I have missed anything in the overview of, of the main page. Thank you, Brian. One of the questions that came in was about the interlibrary loan. So if you're gonna be fully online, will you still be able to make use of those services? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so when you log in, you have the, like the form is digital and so on. The, the hard, the hard um, scenario there is if, if it's a physical book and you want the whole book, then, um, I mean, try and see if they can, if they'll let you. I know for a while, uh, like when, when COVID was, you know, first shut down the, the universities and so on, a lot of libraries stopped sending physical books just because, you know, at that point it wasn't clear how the, how the, um, how the virus was spreading and all that. And so they just didn't want to deal with anything physical. I think that's that's subsided now, and so I think physical books are, are um, easier easier to get. But I would try. I mean, you know, if there's a if there's a particular book, if it's all digital, then interlibrary loan, yeah, I mean, they they thrive on that, and they're amazingly fast. I mean, there have been times when I've given presentations and I find an article I want, I do an interlibrary loan request, and then by the time I'm back in my office, it's you know, I already have it. So it's yeah, they're they're very good. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> or the other possibility is, if there's something you want to get, uh, and maybe interlibrary loan can't get it or whatever, is contact the librarian in your field and see if they have a way of, of helping you as well. Because one thing we can do, and I'll just I'll point this out here, but it might be better just to contact the librarian. Is there's um, oh, where is it now? 
there we go, suggest a purchase. So that if you find that there's a particular book that we that we should have, that you think we should have, uh, make a suggestion and, and we can see what we can do. Um, our budget actually is not that bad this year. Um, last year, about this time, we were saying basically we had no money because we didn't think we had any money, but uh, we do have some money this year so far. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, suggest a purchase or contact your librarian or interlibrary loan. There are, there are various ways of, of getting access. Another question is for articles they have access to, uh, and I'm assuming they mean through the library, is it safe to assume they are scholarly and able to be cited in research papers? Oh, that's a good question. And let's get to that in, in a minute. Because um, we you know, once we start searching in one search, that distinction will be hopefully become a little more obvious. And then when I start when I start complaining about Google later, um, that'll come up again. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions we have at this time. Cool. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through one search, um, which is basically page two of the of the handout. Uh, and then I'll probably give you a, at that point, I'll give you like a five minute break and you know, so you can practice searching and so on. Obviously, feel free to to, to search while I'm talking as well. And um, yeah, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, yeah, I think I've done everything. Okay, so um, one search again is our big general finding aid. Technically, it's not a database because it combines a whole bunch of different databases. Uh, and so yeah, that's a weird distinction that librarians get into. Um, but the but the idea then is you do, well, at least initially with the basic search, there's an advanced search, which I probably won't show you, but there's a basic search. What you do is you put in your keywords, right? What, whatever they are. Let's see, okay, I'm gonna do magic lanterns. Um, this is a, an, an obscure, uh, an obscure historical instrument. It actually, it was for, for it, it's sort of like the a, a 19, an 18th century version of PowerPoint, but anyway. So I'm gonna, I wanna do a research on magic lantern. So it's kind of a, a technology thing. So I just put my keywords in, right? Um, and I get about 54,000 or so results. This is one of the things about OneSearch is, which is good and bad, kind of like Google is, you're gonna get a lot of stuff um, because it's connecting to so many different databases. But at the same time, you're going to get too much stuff. I mean, there's no way that you're gonna go through 54,000 results. And a lot of them aren't gonna be that relevant, right? So there, there are a few, a few tricks to, to focusing your search. And this is part of the idea with doing, again, especially graduate level work is figuring out your keywords, right? Figuring out, um, you know, getting enough keywords so that you're, you're, um, you're showing or, or you're looking for the right stuff. So you don't get a lot of irrelevant material and you actually find most of what you want, okay? Um, and there is, there is one element here, uh, which is that, you really need to focus on the vocabulary you're using um, because especially in some fields you know there's a shift between how how people in popular culture talk about something or the terms they use and how scholars talk about it an example i used from education a few years ago now the student was looking for um she, she was doing a paper on spanking in schools right so there's like a dozen states where teachers are allowed to spank students and um and she wasn't finding very much, I mean, letters to the editor and stuff like that. And the reason was because spanking is not the right word. If you're in, if you're doing scholarship, you know, scholars don't talk about spanking. What they talk about is corporal punishment, right? That's the technical scholarly word. And once she figured that out, then she started finding the scholarship stuff. So depending on your field, you just make sure that you're using the kinds of keywords that are going to connect you to scholarly uh, material uh hopefully right I, or just be aware that um that, that that the terms are really important and that they also have a history right and so you know if you're doing a search for something and you're using a term that's 50 years old that may be you know you may you may not be finding any of the newer stuff because the terminology has has changed all right another way or one way of, of focusing your result is there's this thing called well it's, it's called a phrase search because the idea here is that you know, I'm not interested in things or in material that have the word magic on page two and lantern on page seven, right? What I'm looking for is magic lantern as a concept, as a single phrase, right? Uh, and so what I do is I put quotation marks around it. This works in Google. It works pretty much anywhere that you, you're able to search. And what that allows me to then do is, is focus the search only for that phrase. You'll find one of the uses of this is if you're doing searches for place names. So if I was doing something on Pearl Harbor, for instance, 
I would put quotation marks around Pearl Harbor so that I'm not just finding, you know, stuff where they, you know, they talk about, you know, harbors that are full of pearls or something like that, right? So you can see that that got rid of half of my, uh, half of the results, actually more than that, right? Got rid of about 60% of the results. And that's good because now I know that all of these at least have the phrase magic lantern in their, um, uh, somewhere in, in the record and so on. Okay. Now, of course, one of the problems is that there's, there are other terms for magic lantern, but I, I won't get into that. The other thing to do, obviously, is to add things, right? So if I say Britain, for instance, now there's an issue there. Do I say Britain or United Kingdom? But that's all right. I, again, there, there are ways of, of trying to, to formulate where you add, where you use Boolean logic to, to do this sort of thing. But I, yeah, I, I won't talk about that so much. Um, but that's, again, something to consider, especially with place names. There's a lot of variations. Notice I'm down to about 3,000. All right. So that's one way to focus your search. Come up with enough terms. The second way is on the left side here, there are various ways of tweaking your results. Um, so if I go down, for instance, oops, like I can go to, to collection, right? So if I know that we have a particular collection that would be useful. Uh, in this case, I don't think there is, but it, there might be, right? So if I wanted medical stuff on Magic Lantern, which I don't think there are any, but I could then say, well, okay, I want to go to Medline, for instance, as my collection. The other is I can I can specify a particular creation date. This is very common. Like say, for instance, that you wanted, uh, you know, you wanted material from the last 20 years, say, right? What I would do is I, I would change the date. I'll just change it to 2000. Make sure you hit refine here. And then what you get are just the most recent materials, right? Some, you know, lost another thousand or so. Um, you can also do it the other way. If I wanted old stuff on, on Magic Lanterns, then I could put, for the date, I could put, you know, leave the first date blank and put, you know, 1900 for the second date or something like that. The resource type is, is potentially quite useful as well. Like, say, for instance, uh, you're looking for dissertations on a particular topic. Uh, you know, then you would click dissertations. If I click on the show more here, you see that there are a whole bunch of other uh, ways of limiting things. One thing I wouldn't recommend doing typically is limiting it to articles because there's a better way of finding the scholarly stuff because articles is a genre that, that's a little, uh, a little vague, but possibly. But if, for instance, I wanted books, like say I wanted a, a book level discussion about Magic Lanterns, then I could click on books here and it would give me the books that were available. So resource type is, is potentially useful, especially if you're looking for audio. Like say I wanted, and, and there won't be any, but if I wanted you know, um, like CDs on, on Magic Lanterns and I could click audio on, on this side. It doesn't show up because there aren't any. Okay, more importantly though, is this one here, which is the availability. And there are two that are typically used. One of them is available online, which actually I wouldn't recommend you do if you're doing your research for a, you know, a master's thesis or a dissertation because if you're supposed to do a literature review, whether something's online or not is not relevant, right? And you don't want to be in a position where you miss some really important article because you only wanted to find things that were online. So I, I wouldn't recommend doing that in this case. Um, sometimes it's useful though, but one that is important is the peer reviewed journals because of what that gives you is it, it limits the search to peer reviewed journals. And you can see here how we're down to 750 at this point. Um, still too many, but it's getting there, right? And um, and so you can see how, you know, as you tweak by the type of material, by the date, by the keywords, and so on, you you end up getting more and more relevant uh, results. One quick annoyance here is that if I add another term up here, and I'm not going to do it yet, if I add another term up here, it deletes all my filters, and that's I don't know why it's, it doesn't seem like a good idea to me, but that's what it does. The way you solve that is you just you have to click on remember all filters and then it locks those filters in place and so now i can put another um i'll do victorian to see if i don't know if this is a good one or not but so i want you know victorian britain magic lanterns i'm down to 376 so okay so that's not that's not bad um okay so let's say that i'm happy with that search uh one of the things i can do is if i sign in i haven't signed in yet you go through your you know, your login here. All right, so you should see my name up there now. So I, I'm logged in. So now what I've, I've got is I've got one, uh, one more feature here, which is I can save my query. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna save the keywords and the, the filters and so on. The other thing it's gonna do is it's going to let me turn on notifications for this query. I won't do it here. I'll show you how to do it. 
on the on the page itself. Uh, so now that I've logged in, if I click on the push pin here, what it gives me is my saved records. I haven't, I didn't save any today. And then it gives me my saved searches. And so you can see here, this is the search I just did. Uh, if I click on it, it'll take me back to the search. But over on the right side, there's this little bell. And if I click on the bell, what it's going to give me is then any time that something new is added to the databases that match my criteria, I'll get an email saying something matched your criteria. And so I don't have to keep going back and searching and, you know, and being paranoid that I'm going to miss something uh, because I'll get notifications when new things come up. And again, I think at the graduate level, that's a lot more reassuring because then you can come up with you know, however many different searches you need to do to cover your, your topic. And then just turn on notifications and then you know maybe check every once in a while manually but but generally you can keep on top of the new material that way um and then if you want to delete the um the search you just click on the the no the no push pin here and it, and it gets rid of it and to go back i'll click on the um, go to search so i would you know again as a long-term plan i would i would recommend that all right let's see how we get something from here uh, and notice as well that because this is peer reviewed, um, you know, I, I'm relatively assured that it's a, that, that these will be you know, legitimate peer reviewed scholarly articles. You always have to be paranoid, but it's a good a good chance that these are going to be worthwhile. Uh, okay, I'm going to click on or focus on this third one uh, for reasons that might become apparent uh, in a bit. Uh, History of European ideas. Um, oh, it's ahead of print. I wonder if that's going to work. Okay, maybe I'll I'll go down to another one here. Okay, here we go. Um, so this this is a, a again a fairly standard scenario. We have the title here. There's also a, a read article view contents and available online. So it looks fairly I'm fairly confident that I'll be able to access this. If I click on the title, this gives me the the record in the library. Uh, a few things that are important here. One is that it gives me a, a link to the vendor that we're getting the the um, article from. I can also copy the permalink here if I want, and that's the the persistent or the permanent link to this record so that I can go back to it later if I want to find it or if I want to send it to somebody else. I can also click on citation here. Uh, and what that does is it gives me the citation in various forms. Um, the other thing I can do though, and this is the thing like if, if you're just doing your bibliography manually, this is probably a good way to do it. Uh, it's not always correct, but you know, 99% of the time it's accurate. Um, but if you're doing Zotero, uh, and I'm, I'm not set up to do Zotero right now, but um, what you would do is you would you you would click on the uh, on the Zotero icon up here, and then it would save the reference to your Zotero um, program. Actually, it would if in another page or two, it would save the actual PDF. So um, so the citation is useful for a quick quick and dirty sort of thing. But um, if you're using a bibliographic management program, you wouldn't really use that feature just because there are better ways of doing it. I'm going to skip down a little bit here to the details, partly because it you know, gives you a little bit more information about the article, but more importantly, it gives you the subjects. And this is, again, one of the things as you're sorting out your topics is you need to figure out what your keywords are. And so if you find a good article, if you find an article that fits what you want to, to work on, have a look at the subjects, um, because that's going to help you figure out, okay, like in this case, it's you know it's about shipwrecks for some reason and theater and magic lanterns and so on, and so that might help formulate or might help me add extra material to the uh, you know, the extra keywords to what I'm searching for. Okay, and so that's you know so the description and the keywords and so on are are useful as ways of formulating or helping you formulate better searches, because you know actually the, formulating the searches is half the battle, or more. All right, now let's say I want this, this article. The scenario changes here depending on the vendor. JSTOR is a fairly standard one. Uh, yeah, they're, you know, 10% of them are weird, um, but they generally work. So what I do is I click on the JSTOR Arts and Sciences. I have to log in. I usually have to log in like five or six times during these presentations. Um, okay, it remembered that I logged in, so that's good. So now I'm in, now I'm in JSTOR. Uh, and then it gives me the PDF. Typically, there's another stage here, which is download PDF. Right? So if I download PDF, I have to accept the, the conditions sometimes, which, which messes up Zotero in this case. Um, but there's the article, right? So now all I have to do is save it. 
it gives me a weird name, but I'll, I'll deal with that later and click save. And so now I've got that article. Right. So, you know, in a matter of seconds, I've, I've downloaded one article. And, you know, so if you again, if you've got a good search, you can really uh, find a lot of material fairly quickly um, through these uh, through this um, process to do so. So let me run through one more scenario here, which is that if we've got um, like there are a lot of articles or a lot of references that we have that we don't actually have online uh, online. You know, we, we, we haven't uh, subscribed to them. Um, and I think this is, well, let's see if this is an example. So if I click on here to get access options, or actually I can just click on the title. There are two scenarios here, right? One of them is going to be that we have the physical book. In this case, it looks like we might have the physical journal um, where I can scan a request. But if I didn't, like if, if the library didn't have the physical journal, nonetheless, what you would see here is this link here, which is request PDF scan from item not owned by UH libraries. And that's where the, you, you trigger the interlibrary loan request. So I'm gonna click on that. Let's see if this works here. I have to log in again. Okay, now the, the great thing about this is that if you find the record in our in, in, um, through OneSearch and you click on ILL, it'll fill it out for you. This is what a scan request looks like. Um, so you can see here that there's you know, the journal title, the author, the volume, the year, and so on. This is all the information that you would be expected to give to interlibrary loan if you found your article somewhere else. Um, but ultimately, what I would have to do is I would just click submit request. And then they say it takes about a week or so to get material. As I say, you know, often they're a lot faster than that. Sometimes it does take that long, sometimes a little longer. But um, yeah, but it's free. You can use it as often as you want to support your, your research. And, and if you find something through OneSearch that doesn't have uh, that we don't have um, access to either through print or, or through um, uh, our vendors, then you would just do an interlibrary loan request. So that's the other scenario. Okay. Incidentally, let me show you just quickly, and this will be page three, which, which will go quite quickly, is I'm going to get rid of my filters here. And let me just do Magic Lantern. If I want to find an ebook, uh, it's this there's an easy way of doing that with the filters, which is essentially there are two different uh, filters you need to do. One of them is you say available online because it's an ebook. Uh, and then the other is under resource type, I click on more here, there's books, right? So if I click on that, then I get that intersection of online and, and books. And so I get <clears throat> basically this is how you get ebooks. And typically then if I, if I click on the uh, reference here, the view online, it, it, what it's going to do is it's going to take me to the online book, which I can read online on through my browser. And then depending on the license that we've got, <clears throat> what we can do is you can also download the book. You have to install a program, which is which we talk about on page three, called Adobe Digital Editions. It's a free, uh, it's a free program, kind of like you know the PDF reader, uh, but it handles the licensing and stuff for. Um, for the books but yeah we can just uh, you can download the book and then you can check it out uh, say here i think you can check it out for 180 days or something like that it depends on the book so just you know be aware of that um or you can read it online in which case you just get a, a fairly typical online book um series you can search within it table of contents and all that kind of stuff so yeah and we have thousands thousands and thousands of, of ebooks now Okay, so that's basically one search, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, the big thing is tweaking your strategies in terms of keywords and, and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, but that's that's how you access our our main collection. What I want to show you next, then, and this is page four. Oops, sorry. Are some of the specialized databases. Uh, the way you access them, some of them are listed on that page. Again, as I showed you earlier, there's probably about 500 or so um, that are available. Uh, and they have different interfaces. They tend to have stronger search terms. Um, there are search tools and so on. Um, and let's see. I don't think, I mean, I probably don't, well, here, I'll just show you one just to show you, you know, so this one I think is an EBSCO one. Um, yeah, so here's the search for, um, this is Agricola, which is the agriculture database created by the um, 
US federal government, I think. But you can see here how there's a lot more complexity in terms of how you search. Um, and the other thing is because it's a specialized database, you wouldn't really need to put like agriculture as a keyword because all of this is about agriculture. There are times when you might want to, but generally because it's specialized, you can you can use more specialized terms and, and so on. Uh, so that's, yeah, those are the specialized databases. And I would, again, encourage you to get familiar with them, you know, they're especially you know, in your field. Okay, but that's page, page four, it's just an overview of that. Um, and then there are some specialized presentations that we give on on the different databases so have have a uh, you know look out for those all right let me go back and i want to talk about google or google scholar uh, or a bit of both i suppose so the great thing about google i mean google you can put any keyword you want in and you will find millions of pages so you can you can get a lot of results and you can get them very quickly you know kind of like a fast food restaurant but generally it's not it isn't good information for a scholarly kind of communication. Google is great for certain things, right? Like if you wanted to find you know, where the, the nearest Thai restaurant is, Google's amazing for that, right? But, but it's not really good if you're doing scholarly stuff. But basically the reason why certain things go onto the first page or the second page of Google have nothing to do generally with the quality of the information. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with just how Google's algorithms sort out what goes on top and so on. Um, what Google did, uh, though, in response to that, is that they created this subset of Google called Google Scholar. Uh, now, you can get there if you want just by going scholar.google.com. Uh, it's better if you go through our web, web page to let Google know that you're part of the University of Hawaii. But if I go to databases here, oh, just to point out, first of all, um, in the databases, we have various subject lists. So that gives you, you know, so you don't have to scroll through all of them. But the other is that you can search the databases for a particular, either a particular term like education or a particular database name like Google. We count Google as a database. All right, there's Google Scholar. It once again would ask me to log in, but I've logged in enough that it's fine. Um, notice here, scholar.google.com. Um, and then if I do, well, here, I'll do Magic Lantern again. Put in quotation marks. Right, so there are about 26, you know, 27,000 or so. Uh, so there are a few things with Google. One of them notices that the searching is actually relatively limited. You can limit by time. Um, there's a, there is kind of a, an advanced search here, but it doesn't really give you a lot of control. I mean, you can do exact, um, exact words and so on and maybe author but it's yeah it, you know google is really powerful because of the way that it lets you do really simple searches and then it finds you the stuff that it thinks you want so uh, anyway uh so you know and again you can add more terms here if you want um, but notice on the right side and this is why i logged in is that i get this full text at uh manoa and what that means is that if I click on here, Google would then send me back to the University of Hawaii library website and give me access to this article. So Google knows by and large what we have in our collection. And if you log in, then Google will be able to send you back to our collection to get it. That does not work for books in general, but it works for journal articles. And so that's that's useful. Notice as well, um, and actually there won't be examples of all of this here, but what Google Scholar ends up including are a lot of journals um, a lot of books and a lot of government documents, right? And so you'll get things like environmental impact statements and things like that that are not scholarly in, in, a, in the traditional sense, but they are maybe a little bit more reliable than, um, than popular documents, I suppose, or however you wanna uh, mark that distinction. Uh, one of the things that Google is not good at, just to, to warn you, is there, they are not good or it's not good at getting rid of what are called predatory journals, which are essentially fake scholarly journals, journal, yeah, fake scholarly journals that, that are, are just a business, right? And what will happen is, you know, scholars will get emails from, from these journals saying, hey, you should publish with us and so on. And if you send them their, your article, they'll say, oh, this is great, you know, um, you send us some money and, and we'll publish it. And so you send them the money, they, they make their money that way. And then they do nothing. I mean, they might, they probably publish it, but there's no editorial oversight. There's no peer review system and so on and so forth. They'll publish anything. Um, and, and 
yeah, it's it's a money maker and it, it's just fake scholarship. So just be aware of that. That Google isn't necessarily uh, good at at excluding those. Um, those and some of them are really good at faking being scholarly. So anyway. Um, okay, one thing about Google, though, is that it does not give you access to the articles themselves. And so one thing that you might find, for instance, is if I click on one of these, I, I won't bother clicking on it, but if I click on some, you'll hit a page where it'll say, you know, give us $20 or give us $100 and we'll send you the article. It still might be a legitimate article, but it's, you know, be, but because you're not paying for access through, through us or through Google, you know, you're not going to get it for free. And so that's an instance where you're going to use interlibrary loan. So if you find an article that you like through Google, still go back to the library and fill out the interlibrary loan form. Uh, let's see, a couple other things here with, with, um, with Google. One of them is, so as you're engaging in scholarly communication, you know, trying to get into the arguments that scholars are having about your topic or whatever topic you're interested in, one of the ways of doing that is looking at the bibliographies, right? So if you find an important article, you look at the bibliography, what you end up seeing is where they're coming from. You know, what did those authors read in order to, to create their, their work, their, their article or their book and so on. And that's important because it gives you a sense of where the arguments have come from. The other thing you can do, uh, and Google is quite good at, at helping you with this, is you can see who is citing the particular article you're reading. Right. And so in this case, for instance, the magic, uh, the magic of the magic lantern, this has been cited 63 times. Right. And so what that means is if I got this article, I could look at the bibliography, but I could then also click on the cited by and I could see all of the material that is citing that particular article. So if it's an important article that becomes kind of a foundation stone for figuring out where the, the scholarship is coming from and going to. Right. So have a look at that. Other databases will offer that as well. But yeah, this idea of cited by is important as a, as a way of tracing out your, uh, your research. And it also gives you a sense of how relevant a particular work is. So for instance, that this is cited 629 times makes it, makes it significant. It may not be right. It may not be interesting, but it's cited a lot. And so it's, it's, a, you know, it's more embedded in the conversations that are happening around that topic. Um, so that's, that's important. The other thing you can do, and this is not gonna be a good example, I think, but if I click on cited by, again, it gives me a list of the 629. I can then also search within a citing article, right? And so I can say what I want is, I don't know, I'll say England just out of the hope that it might show up. Yeah, so 178 of them, right? So what that means is that of, of the material that is citing this particular book, 178 of them mention England. And so it, it really helps me focus my search based on the literature, not just on, on the keyword. Okay, but that's, that's Google Scholar. And, you know, it's, again, it's, there are problems with it. There are concerns about what gets included and so on, but it's also a huge database. And this is why, you know, Google itself has been so popular. It's just, it has so much stuff. Um, incidentally, Google itself, I think, estimates that they've indexed less than 5% of the internet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I know it's got the illusion of being comprehensive, but it, it's no, nowhere near that. Um, okay, so let me show you just um, a, a couple more, more things quickly then. Um, and actually, what I want to do is I'm going to show you some tricks with Google um, that, that will help you get better results as well. Uh, so one of them is, um, well, first of all, it's yet, let's do, I'm going to do Pearl Harbor. Notice I put it in quotation marks. I get 26 million, 27 million um, hits. Uh, first one is, is uh, government, and then I get a bunch of planning my visits and so on, um, and then some ads, and then some more ads, and then some org stuff, Wikipedia, and then go Hawaii. So I get, you know, it kind of, I get a bunch of touristy stuff, and then I get some generic history things, which are not uh, peer-reviewed scholarly. I mean, history.com is, is not, uh, you know, it's sort of a Wikipedia level, right? And that's okay, but you know you just have to keep keep in mind that there's really no scholarship here at all. Um, okay, but what I can do is with with Pearl Harbor is or one of the tricks with Google is say I wanted to find where is Pearl Harbor mentioned in websites connected to the University of Hawaii. Right, so I want to limit my search to a particular domain on the internet. The trick here is you put the word site colon. And then you put the URL that you want to limit your search to. 
right? So if I do hawaii.edu, then it's going to search only hawaii.edu websites for the, the phrase Pearl Harbor, right? Then I'm down to about 20,000. And you can see here how there are libguides. Um, I'm not sure what these are. Pacific Islands, something or other. Uh, digital collections, repositories, UH Press, and so on and so forth. And there's SOAST, right? Uh, and so what I've done then is I've limited my search to a particular domain, right? And if you can find the right domain, then, you know, you can, you can search for pretty much anything, right? And so let me, and, and part of it then is to figure out what the, the structure of the internet is, right? So if I do EDU, what that does is it limits it to educational institutions in the United States, right? So I'm going to find probably a lot more. Yeah, 187,000. You can see here how, um, yeah, they're from various universities um, around the country, right? If I do .gov, then what that's going to limit it to is United States government websites. Obviously, the National Park Service comes up fairly quickly, um, and recreation.gov archives. So yeah, there's archives.gov. So let's say if I wanted to search in the archives, the government archives, I would do archives.gov, Pearl Harbor, and then that's going to limit it to to sites connected to the archives. Um, so that's that's that. Now the other one, whoops, sorry, not sure why that went there. Uh, so gov is US government, MIL is US military, and they publish an awful lot of stuff. I mean, you know, this is where you would get things like um, you know, like environmental impact statements and so on. If you're doing education, I mean the, the number of uh, the number of schools run by the US military is, is huge, right? Um, but so here's an example where you know, I find Pearl Harbor on US military sites. I can also expand it not just to the United States, but say I wanted to find like, is there any mention of Pearl Harbor in you know, on websites in New Zealand, say, right? Well, what I need to know is what the country code is for New Zealand. Uh, and I do that site colon, and then it happens to be NZ. Most of them are fairly self-explanatory. Some of them are a little weirder, not weirder, but you know, they're in, um, I, I like like Canada is CA, South Africa is ZA, I think, or ZA as they would say, because I think, yeah, it's, um, yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, so you just have to figure out what the, the country code is. Um, so I hit return here. And then what I get are, well, 153,000. I get a lot because you'll notice that some of these are just Pinterest, right? So so all of the dot coms in New Zealand have sort of taken over my, um, uh, my searches. But look at this one. So nzhistory.govt.nz. So if I wanted to search for New Zealand government websites, I would do govt.nz. And then I would just get the New Zealand government websites. New Pearl Harbor is not a great example for this in some ways. Um, but if I was doing something on like substance abuse, or if I was doing something on indigenous education or something like that, limiting my search to New Zealand you know, might be useful, and especially New Zealand government might be useful. So that's one of the things to do with with um, with Google is use the site um, the site tool, and it's actually also very practical, right? So like if I go um, like this happened a few years ago now, a student I was giving a presentation, we took a break, and he wanted to know where the nearest vending machine was at uh, at the University of Hawaii. This was back on campus, and I, I don't know if you've used the University of Hawaii website, but it's not the greatest for finding things. And so what I was able to do is basically use Google as a as a way of getting into the university website without having to use the university website. And all I did was I just did vending machine site colon hawaii.edu. So it limits it to Hawaii edu and then there's the vending machine site. I click on that and then there's the map, right? So it was very fast. And I think if I had tried to do that through the UH Manoa website, it would have taken me forever. So, so keep that just as a practical, uh, as a practical tool. Um, and then it also, again, it allows you to limit yourself to maybe more reputable websites and things like that. Yeah, I think that's it. So on page seven, you know, there are some other more specialized searches as well. Uh, Google, for instance, has, like if I go to the general Google, there's an images database that I can search for. So again, I can do like Pearl Harbor. And it searches for Pearl Harbor, but there are some other things here that are, that are kind of interesting. If I click on whoop, tools here. I could specify, for instance, what color I wanted. So that if I'm looking for a picture of Pearl Harbor that is largely orange, and that'll be a weird one, but let's see. 
what it will do is it will find pictures that are dominantly orange. Um, so if you're into design and you need to find a particular one. Also by type, let me get rid of this one. If I go tools and by type, I can say, okay, I want a line drawing. Right? And then I get, a, I get line drawings of Pearl Harbor. So if you're putting together a coloring book or something, that would be something to use. Uh, the time is how long ago it was posted, the size of it, if you want a large or a small one. Um, and then usage rights becomes important as well, whether you want something that is uh, copyrighted still or open access or Creative Commons and so on. I, I won't get into that, but something to consider, especially if you plan to publish anything, is you want to find images that are, that are clear of, uh, of copyright limitations. Um, there is an interesting thing. I'm not, I don't have a picture to, to show you, but you can also do a reverse picture lookup so that if you find a picture somewhere and you want to see where it's come from, you click on the little camera here and then you, you upload your image or if, if there's an image URL. And then what Google will do is it will go out and find the image and, and tell you where it was found and, and in what context and so on. This is a great way of doing, a great way of doing information literacy stuff. So if you find one of those fake pictures, you can see where it showed up initially and things like that. So that, that's useful. And I think that's, that's it. I mean, you know, so there's a, like the final page. Oh, actually, no, let me sh show you, sorry, two more things. Um, one of them, and I'll do a search for this, is as, as, a, as part of the University of Hawaii now, um, you get a free subscription to the New York Times for a year. So I'm just gonna do a search up here for New York Times. Oh, no, that didn't, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the way to do it. Sorry, we go to research guides and then do a search for New York Times. And it's got basically information on how to access it. There's a little form you fill out. You, um, uh, you, you fill out the form, they send you an email, you send an email back to confirm, and then you get free, uh, free access for 365 days. One good thing about that is that the New York Times has been around since the 1850s. And so if you're doing anything historical, um, it's, a, yeah, it's an, an interesting and, and useful, uh, useful resource. There are issues with the New York Times, as, as there are with any sources. Um, but you know, it, is a, it is a substantial newspaper that's been around a long time. It's also good if you want to keep up on current events and so on. That's one of the features. But what I wanted, the last thing I want to show you, until I remember other things that I forgot, is um, Ulrich's web. This is on page eight of the handout. Now, the question had been asked earlier, how do you tell if a journal is scholarly or not? And there are various clues that you can, you can look for. You know, how long has it been around? Who's publishing it? Is it associated with a university or one of the large journal um, companies and so on? And the way you find out that kind of information is if you click on databases, there's this, uh, well, I don't know if it's a person or not, but it's called Ulrich. Um, I'll just do Ulrich here. Ulrich's web is a database of journals. So I will do journal of education. What, what you do is you search for the title of the journal itself, and then it gives you all of the ones that have journal of education. There are a lot of them here for obvious reasons. Um, and then it gives you there's some basic information. What you would want to focus on are the columns here. The first one, tells you whether it has a table of contents. The second one is the important one for this context, which is, is it refereed or not? That, I, that little thing is a referee um, uh, shirt, which I didn't realize. Um, and then also whether it's electronic and also whether it's open access. Uh, some journals now are open access, which means that uh, they're, they're free to access um, and so on, but, uh, and some aren't, a lot, still a lot aren't. Um, and then it tells you who the publisher is. Sage Publication is a very large, legitimate journal publishing uh, company. They do more than more than uh, more than books. And then where it's where it's from, where it's at, um, is it still active, and so on. Then if you click on the title, it's going to give you details for that particular journal. Um, things like how often is it published. So when you're at the stage of uh, getting ready to publish articles, for instance. This is a very useful resource because it gives you just sort of nuts and bolts information about the journal, the website and so on, um, where it's abstracted. And this is another key indication of, of whether an article is um, scholarly or not, or whether a journal is scholarly, is whether it's indexed. Because index, indexing is kind of a quality control part of the whole system. And so, you know, that this is uh, indexed by EBSCO, is, is very, very important. But I mean, it's got all of them, right? Taylor Francis, ProQuest, Gale, and so on. And so it, this is a heavily indexed journal. And so it's quite clearly a scholarly journal. 
doesn't make it right, but it's it's clearly substantial in the, in the scholar in, in scholarship. So yeah, just remember Ulrich, Ulrich's web when you've got those kinds of questions, like you know, is this a legitimate uh, a legitimate journal or not? And with that, I think I'm done. I'm trying to remember what I've forgotten here. Uh, but are there any questions or things that you want me to cover that I haven't? And while we're waiting, let me just quickly show you the advanced search. Uh, I don't use the advanced search very much. Um, so, you know, but, but essentially it, it, you know, it allows you to specify things like, you know, that you can find, like what field you're searching for, right? So if I'm searching for things by Thomas Hobbes, I can put author creator is Hobbes Thomas. Um, and then, well, I mean, that would be enough, right? And so what I would end up then getting are, um, are the things written by Hobbes rather than all of the things about Hobbes. And that's important, especially when you're dealing with a proper name of a famous person. Thomas Hobbes is a 17th century English philosopher, but he, um, you know, but, but the idea there is that I want stuff written by him, but if I just do a keyword search for Thomas Hobbes, I'm going to get thousands and tens of thousands of, of, of items because a lot of stuff was written about him. Right. And so that's one place where you would where you do the advanced search is if you wanted to specify an author. Um, and then you can specify date and material type and so on, which is kind of what ends up showing up in the tweaks anyway. That's why I tend not to use advanced search because you just do a basic search and then tweak and then you end up more or less with the same thing. Oh, yeah. So you have one question. Do you prefer Zotero, EndNote or a different bibliographic management program? So I, I, use, I use Zotero. I, and part of it is that it's because I was because I teach it, I sort of have to use it anyway. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the biggest thing there is that it's free, which is which is useful. Um, it's it's quirky. I mean, there are some things that are annoying with it. Some of them are not Zotero's fault. I mean, some of it is just the nature of, of how information works. Um, I think Mendeley is probably my least likely to use. Um, it tends to be more science based. And it's also just not as widely used. Uh, EndNote seems fine. I've I've used it. I, I'm not that familiar with it. The big thing there is you have to pay for it, uh, and so, yeah. So that's that's a potential a, a potential issue. But you know, honestly, when I've seen like so I've seen presentations on all three, and they're like 95% the same, uh, and so there's not a huge difference there. One of the things that I would recommend though is, depending on your situation, figure out who your colleague or sorry, figure out what your colleagues are using. Because if you're in a in an office that everyone's using Mendeley and you're using Zotero, even if Zotero is the better program, in that context it's not because they don't you know, those programs don't talk well to each other, and so it's hard to move material from one uh, one platform to another. So I would, um, yeah, I that that would be sort of one of the criteria, but honestly, yeah, I, I mean pick one and 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 see how it goes. Uh, because yeah, there's not a huge difference. So that's why I would end up probably recommending Zotero unless there's a compelling reason to not use it. How's that for a long-winded answer? To, <laughs> and to expand on what Brian just said, uh, which we'll go over in the Zotero workshop on Monday, is some of the software has the ability to share information. You can create groups within the program itself um, to share. So, uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to maybe clarify <laughs> what I'm trying to explain there. Yeah, I mean, I won't, I won't take up time now, really. But yeah, so if if you have multiple people with Zotero accounts, then you can actually share your material to some extent online, so that you can you can create group bibliographies and so on. You can't share the PDFs, I don't think, because of copyright. But you can share the bibliographic stuff in in groups and so on. So it it really helps with collaboration, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me show you quickly how to al access Ulrich's web. So just a general idea here is that if you want to see what materials we have available in terms of databases and so on, it's either going to be OneSearch or it's going to be in the databases. Right? Those are really the two big options for that. Um, and so I click on databases here and then I can search either by topic, I can find like education databases or whatever, or I can just do I, and I just did all Rick. I didn't do all Rick's because I, di I just need enough to distinct, you know, so that I can find what I'm looking for. So I hit return and then there's all Rick's web here. You have to log in um, again, because I've logged in so often, it's not asking me to now, but yeah, that's how you get to all Rick's web. Okay. And it's, it's one of these things like, you know, when you need it, it's very useful, but you, you generally don't need it. Um, you know, it's, 
yeah, as, as you know, there are various databases that are they're kind of like that. And actually, let me let me say something about the library that I think I, I mentioned quickly, but I just want to reiterate, one of the functions of the library is to offer study spaces, um, you know, we have the little graduate study carols, which are not very big, but um, but the other is we just have a lot of space. It's a huge, it's actually probably the biggest building on campus. There are two, really two buildings, five stories each, um, and all of the different collections are everywhere. And there are, you know, there are quiet areas and there are places where we allow, uh, you know, small group activities and talking and things like that. I, I forget what our, I mean, our, our capacity is in the hundreds, uh, even with COVID, uh, you know, once the stacks get open, there'll be a lot of, um, a lot of spaces to study. So it's a good, you know, if, if you're on campus, it's a good place to, to go. One drawback, unfortunately, is, is that we, um, we don't allow food in the library. Uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it, it just to reiterate is that, you know, the Hawaiian Pacific collection, it's on the fifth floor of the main building. And it is, I mean, it is the, 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 it is the best collection of, of, of Hawaii and Pacific related material probably in the world. Um, and, but having said that, there are also other libraries or other resources around, uh, around the state uh, that, that you, you know, that could be useful. The Mission Houses Museum, for instance, Bishop Museum, uh, and then in other fields, right? So there's a, there's a medical library down at Jabsom, right? And so if you're doing any um, health, allied health related uh, topics, that would be a place where you, you could access material as well. So keep in mind, yeah, that there is this sort of, you know, there are a lot of different possible institutions that will help you. We're probably the core one, given, you know, that you're graduate students at UH uh, and, you know, and, and talk to your librarians because you know, we'll, we'll help you find those sorts of things. I wanna say a big mahalo to Brian Richardson from the UH library for showing us how the university library can support you through your graduate student experience. Uh, everyone, please take care, stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us on a weekend. This concludes our session.